Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, the young and old, we will come here to the Ugandan podcast. And you know what we do right here? We explain and simplify government programs, projects, and policies. And uh, best believe that today we have one of the coolest and uh, an analytical and uh, I, I want to say many things, but let me not preempt. But once again, I welcome you. I'm your host, Brandy Valentine. And uh, welcome to the Ugandan podcast, Dr. Amina Zawede, the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of ICT and National Guidance. Best believe that we're going to be talking all things ICT and uh, tech and artificial intelligence and everything you really want to know in this sector. And uh, you're welcome, Dr. Amina Zawede. Thank you, Brandy. Yeah. Valentine Naziri. And finally, you're here. Finally, I am here yeah. after having seen you run your programs from my minister to the state ministers. Yeah. And now myself, I don't know who is next. We, we can't tell you. Where, where you would... should be next. I'm here mm-hmm. to stay for all this time. Don't worry. I will worry. interview you when the time comes. Okay, that's all right. Uh, we are, first of all, excited to have you as the permanent secretary for the Ministry of ICT. And uh, I know you have uh, done a great time now. But I want you to give us a background on who are you besides being the permanent secretary of Ministry of ICT and National Guidance? Well, who am I? Currently, I'm the permanent secretary of the Ministry of ICT and National Guidance. My name is uh, Dr. Amina Zawedia. I don't have so many long names. I mm. only have those two. Mm. I try to add my father's name as a third. And then my, my husband would have been fourth, but my father told me to work for my name. Yeah. And that is why I'm Amina Zawede. Yes. Working for my name. Yes. Uh, Amina Zawede is an academician. I have been in academia for over, I think, 15 years before I became permanent secretary. But I've also been working in the ICT sector as mm. a member of the board of a national IT authority of Uganda. I am also a director or member of board, if you want to call it, of DFCU Limited, the group company of DFCU. Some money. Hmm? You, yeah, just be positive. Money will come. <laughs> okay. Money yeah. always comes. You know, when someone says they are on a board of a bank, you're like, mm. no, of the group. Of the group, but yeah. it has the bank inside. It owns eh. the bank. It even owns the bank. Well mm. done. And, Thank uh, you. So what exact what does the permanent secretary represent? So that when we meet people in your caliber, we know how to approach so that we don't just come. Yeah. What does a PS do? Now, a PS, a permanent secretary. Back in the days when someone was a secretary, it used to mean that you're typing and, you know, a, a typist or something like that. Yeah. But um, in this world, a permanent secretary is the technical person who drives the ministry. Yeah. who leads the ministry in technical aspects. We have the minister because you ask me, how do you lead yet we have a minister? Yes. The minister is the political head. We yeah. have the political heads and then we have the technical heads who oversee all operations. That is why you see I am a doctor, not of, uh, of medicine, of medicine yeah. <laughs> but I am a doctor of computers. Yes. So uh, I lead and guide uh, direction in the sector on any related issues of IT, of communications, of national guidance, because we are running a ministry of ICT and national guidance. I know my ministers and ministers have really labored to explain yes. what ministry of ICT is. And I beg my viewers or the viewers we have to really go run through these podcasts because they will teach them yeah. or they'll be able to learn what the sector is about and where we are heading. Yes. So technically, I am the lead of the sector. Okay. Yes, and uh, so that means you sign all things, uh, all all things activity, all things money, and all things direction. Yeah, you give the direction. Yeah. Yes, you do lead on budgetary issues yeah. at the ministry, but the ministry also has agencies. It doesn't stand on its own. You see, like a mother or a parent has children. Yeah. The ministry is the mother or the parent. And then the parent has children. Those are the agencies that we have. We have uh, Uganda Communications Commission. We have NITA Uganda, National IT Authority of Uganda. We have UBC, yeah. our TV. Yes. 
UBC is also uh, part of a ministry. We have Uganda Media Center, yes, where you see the press conferences held, uh, and then we have the Media Council. Yes. Is there anything I've forgotten? That is, yeah. GCIC. GCIC, Government mm. Citizen Interaction Center, is sitting in the office of the president, but it is also part of communication. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's dig into these technical things that you know very mm-hmm. well. In uh, in the UNCDF uh, report, the IDIS report. What is UNCDF? You're confusing our viewers. Uganda, United Nations. <laughs> What? United Nations Corporate Development Fund. Fund. Yes. You know, techies have a lot of uh, acronyms mm. all around. So we have to make our viewers understand and appreciate. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. So UNCDF, <laughs> that one <Yeah>. in full. <laughs> in, the, in their report, you said, I quote, inclusiveness starts at policy formulation. The fact that Uganda scores highly in the existing policy and regulation speaks to the will of the country in achieving an inclusive digital economy. Uh, The challenge upon us as a government is moving from policy and regulation to effective implementation. And you also called upon stakeholders to work together with the government to bridge the gap. But what do you propose that we do to match the implementation and the good policies in place? Oh, I said all that. You said all this. Wow. Wow. That was a mouthful. (laughs) Now, let me try to break it down for our viewers. Now, um, first of all, the ministry is in charge or responsible for drawing the direction that we move as a country in whatever we're specializing. And if it is Ministry of Water, it draws policies for water management in this country, for environmental management, for a ministry in charge of that. Now, Ministry of ICT is also in charge of setting that, you know, policy. When you say policy, people might wonder, what is policy? It sounds complicated sometimes, but policy are kind of the, I don't want to use other complicated words like framework, but it is the guide, the sphere within which you're supposed to operate. What guides you? Just like they say, policemen say we keep law and order, so they put the laws and the order yourself in order to keep you in order, you set the laws. So similarly... For the ICT ministry, we have policies that govern how the sector should operate in terms of ICT. Yes. So um, the, you've heard about the Digital Uganda vision of 2040. Now that is a vision the country has, where we want to head and how we will get there and what we will achieve. Yeah. So um, as a country... The United Nations Corporate Development Fund supported us in developing what um, what we call the Inclusive Digital Economy Scorecard. Yes. You know what a scorecard is? It scores you. What have you, where you are, what have you achieved? It gives those kind of indicators. Yes. So, uh, and that scorecard was assessing us in on various things or what we call parameters. Yes. The first parameter was on uh, the regulations and policies and envir- the the environment within which we operate in terms of ICT. Yes. How are we how are we performing? And we scored high. So meaning that we have a good uh, you know uh, guidelines for us to operate. However, they are not implemented yes. well. Yes. And uh there are also other parameters, maybe in skilling, how are we performing in research and development? How are we in infrastructure that is internet connectivity and telecom? How are we doing? So all those were scored, but the highest was on the environment within which we operate. We scored well. However, the implementation of these policies, that is enforcing the policies, just like the policemen, when they get you on the road, and you may be exceeding 80 kilometers per hour, they will stop you and put you to order. Similarly, yes. we have to do that for the ICT sector on various things. We have um, laws like the, you know, uh, Computer Misuse Act, we have Electronic Transactions Act and all this. So if we have them, but then people continue to misbehave online, that means we have not put mechanisms in place to put check on these people yes, or to put them in order. So that is why we uh, say that, you know, when we are developing this guy of uh, frameworks within which we are supposed to operate, then it has to be all inclusive. People should, all stakeholders or people 
who have interest in this should be brought on board right from the beginning so that they understand what is this law about, how am I supposed to behave, so that when it comes to implementing, everyone is on board. Yeah. But sometimes, I think many times we develop policies in, in-house yes. or don't involve uh, stakeholders enough. And then you find that when we say we have this policy in place, People say, oh, there is that policy. But when I stop and tell you, Brandy, you should not do this online because there is this policy and you're going to be maybe given a fine or ticket of this yeah, much. Yeah. If you don't adhere, that is where now we fall short a bit. Yes. Yeah. So we, we are going to do better. On, yeah. On, on so <laughs> going forward, we say, let us do yeah. all there. Yeah, that's why you said all inclusive. Let us bring everybody on board so that we understand what we are putting in place. Then when it comes to implementation, we are all on board and put meca- mechanisms in place to ensure that we adhere. Mm. So we are basically well. going to harmonize. We are harmonizing and then we move all straight in the same direction. Yes. Okay, that's perfect. Mm-hmm. Okay, that brings me to the next question. A BPO and Innovation Council was put in place November mm. 2021. Uh, what targets did you set for them as the technical lead? Mm. Mm. Let us in. And Again, you have gone to an acronym, BPO. Business versus outsourcing. <laughs> you know, viewers, Brandy works for me in the ministry. <laughs> yeah. So when she starts when she starts speaking about jargons and acronyms, don't be surprised. She yes. knows what is happening in Let the me, ministry. I'm going, to, I'm going to make sure I say them in full so they actually know <laughs> that I know what I'm talking about. Yes. Yeah, so uh, business process outsourcing or oh what we call BPO and Innovation Council, the reason why it is it has those two as one in the same name, first of all, um, was to ensure that we create an environment, what we call an ecosystem, uh, through which BPO thrives. Now, what is BPO? Business process outsourcing is a kind of an approach people use it is an approach people use to um, do businesses outside their own companies. Mm-hmm. An example is that uh, right now, if you wanted to, uh, we are developing systems in this country. We have our local innovators who are developing systems, but there are many other countries out there or, or companies that need systems to be developed for them. Yeah. They might not have the developers in their country, but we have developers in Uganda. So they employ them, work on a system from Uganda without going to the US or UK or anywhere abroad. They are seated here and work on their laptops and submit whatever they are doing, get paid and they move on. Mm. Uh, Similarly, it can be done for accounting. Someone uh, does their books of accounts in Uganda for a company in, can even be in Africa, in Kenya or wherever without you moving to that country. So that is what we call business process outsourcing. Mm -hmm. You outsource the function of your company to someone else to do it for you. Now you will find that we have, and many people who do such jobs are the youths. So you find we have a number of our youths here in Uganda. I think 70% of our population are youths. We have a number of them graduating from universities and don't have jobs. But then they don't even know where to get the jobs from or they don't know and yet jobs are available. So what uh, happens normally people are looking to go f- to do, you know, uh, jobs they have not studied for in Dubai to become maybe a cook or housewife, a uh, sorry, housemaid or security guard. Now yeah. we want people to be employed in professions that they studied for. Yes. And that is why, but we have to create an environment where if a company wants to recruit people here in Uganda, developers or accountants or, you know, recruitment officers, all that, how do they come in? How do they not cheat our people and pay them maybe less than what they're supposed to be worth earning? Mm -hmm. And also protect the companies who want to employ our people here because, you know, you can be employed and you don't perform. That's true. Yes. So how we need to create that ecosystem where, you know, people operate comfortably. A company comes, maybe there are policies. Remember, we are in charge of policy as well. There are policies in place that protect both the companies and our youths in operating in the business process outsourcing entity. On the other hand, we say, and innovation. Yes. We, uh, innovation is the way to go. And we have to have, uh, 
people who are thinking on their, you know, thinking creatively. I don't want to say innovatively again in the same sentence of describing innovation, innovation <laughs> yes. but they have to think creatively to come up with solutions that you know uh solve our homegrown uh, Lo- local solutions local for solution local that problems. yeah f- for local problems yes. we know our problems yes. locally we don't want people from outside the country to come and solve our own problems we can do them our, we can solve them ourselves and that means that well, we shall be able to reduce costs of operation of development of acquisition of these systems and maintenance you know what happens when you get a system or solution from abroad yeah. if anything goes wrong you have to ship in the developer or whatever to pay them to maintain the system but here you have the person here it is i think 10k to move from here to the nearest city in entebbe <laughs> so, <10K>. so <laughs> yes, it could so be it. 10k it could be a little more than that but it would not cost you a whole ticket of i don't know four thousand five hundred dollars per diem that's how so many true days yes and, all and hotel these. fees yeah that could feed other like 30 more people or ugandan so we are encouraging local grown solutions and innovations but also have to create that enabling environment True. through which they have to operate now why this council this council is supporting us supporting the ministry it's not that it is going to do the work single handedly it's working alongside the ministry you know when you have a think tank that you work with you bounce yeah. off ideas and i said no this is where we are heading this is what we should do that is what uh, this council is helping us do what do we want them to achieve we want them to tell us do we or not to tell us yeah. we want to work with them to find out what is it that we are lacking why is it that the bpo industry has not picked up in uganda yet it has picked up in india in uh, malaysia and oh, uh, yeah the, in kenya it's picking up and also maybe in west africa why is it in uganda it's not picking then we can bounce off ideas and come up with uh, uh, you know an appropriate way of dealing with it true and uh, so we are looking at whether we need a policy or a strategy yes we have laws in place like the investment you know we have an investment act and employment act are they missing something that can address bpo that we can you know uh, advise should be improved upon yes. or do we really need a new policy altogether yes. and then the strategy that we should follow to do this and also yeah to create an uh, um, a transparent system for supporting innovations in this country and also promoting and marketing them because as a country if we market these innovations or brand them for foreigners abroad it would be easier for them to have trust yeah. in the country if we own this as government instead of them going to you know brand single handedly you know they say that if you do things as a team or as a group you're stronger and together yeah. reach further as opposed to working so alone well, yeah. so we want to do it for our ugandans to show that the country is supportive and has put in put in place mechanisms to support this drive yeah. and we'll measure success maybe in a year's time we should be able to see what how far have we moved yeah. and where we are at the council if you're watching this you have a year <laughs> <laughs> yeah they don't program. have time there's no time there's no time, <laughs> there's no time for wasting time yeah. and also, <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm really excited by the fact that the council is going to help with the boosting of the utilization of the innovation hubs mm. and uh also basically just creating jobs for the young people mm-hmm. i can't wait yeah we all can't wait we all can't yeah. wait yeah that's a good one. you have a big task ahead of them but we all have to own it yes mm. and also it will increase our participation in global conversation so why yeah. not following uh, the conversation on bpo and innovation innovation month is loading anytime soon at the expo march 2022 for the dubai expo for 2020 what plans do we have as a, a country and uh are we how ready are we for the innovation month oh dubai expo innovation month brand is asking me this question <laughs> that's interesting because uh, you yeah, are well i'm going to give a background yes to the dubai expo dubai expo has run for six i think it's going to run it's running for six months yes. started on 1st october 2021 and it's running till the end of march 2022 we have had a number of themes run for each month for the six months yes we were in dubai 
at the during the opening of the expo we had a uganda week that time and i think we saw uh yeah live streaming of yes. that event but now we have walked down the road it's six months now we are closing down but we have the innovation month in march and that is why as a ministry of ict and national guidance of um participating actively in innovations um, bpos we have said and branding the country for investment opportunities in ict yes. that is why we have to take part but now mm. brandy aziri valentine i put you in charge of a committee yes. that is supposed to organize and you know the organizing committee for this innovation week i think it's only fair enough that you tell our viewers and guests Okay. This evening. Now now I'm the guest. Eh? <laughs> yes. But, okay, fine. Over to you, Brandy. Yeah, but one thing is you should be really expectant <laughs> of the innovation month. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. I'm excited. I hope you are as well. We're going to profile some of our favorite and best innovators in Uganda. We're going to have some of them. We're going to fly some of the team to Dubai mm -hmm. and they'll be able to showcase their work and uh, also have B2Bs, meet different investors and get to boost their their what their innovations what is b2b b2 <laughs> b2b is business to business meetings mm. where i meet your business my business meets your business and we see how we can business together mm -hmm. and trade and also get investors and also we're going to be able to participate in global conversations and find out how are other innovators in other countries doing it basically integrate and also we're going to brainstorm and let people know that Uganda has one of the best innovations and you have not seen it yet. Mm. Yeah. And just to add on that, apart from business to business, we're also going to have, uh, you know, maybe business to government. B2Gs. You know, yeah. B2Gs uh, interactions. We'll also have G2G, mm. government to government interactions, so that we see how maybe Uganda and uh, United Arab Emirates, for example, what is it that they can collaborate on in the innovation space? Yeah. If it is a big business, maybe Google or D D Google is it. an example. Google, yeah. please come to us. Yeah. <laughs> that is a trick of the getting you on board. Are ready. Yeah. All, all you know, these big companies that want to, want to work with our government, with yeah. our ministry, to uh, accelerate transformation uh, of this country digitally mm. are welcome and we're going to have engagements with them. Mm. So it's going to be an exciting week or month, but we will have the, 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 I think the highlights or the peak is the innovation week, which is in the third week of uh, 20, yeah, 21st, March 21st to, to 27th March, of yes. March. We would have loved to take all innovators, True. but this is just the beginning. Mm. We are going to do better and better because this is not the only expo we have. We're going to have more expos. They might not be in Dubai or anywhere else, but we are going to plan for them. By the way, I take this opportunity to thank the private sector. Wow. Who have, <laughs> yeah, hand clap, who have worked with us. You know, as a ministry and government, we cannot work on our own. Yeah. We have to work with all uh, partners from different spheres or stakeholders from different spheres, the private sector. We have uh, academia. You know, I told you at the beginning I'm from academia. Yes. We have academia. We have uh, development partners. All these are working with us to ensure that this innovation week in Dubai is a success. And we really, really appreciate mm. your support and collaboration and look forward to this kind of uh, relationship for the sector going forward. Because if we do it now and continue with it consistently and persistently, we are going to grow stronger in this sector. We're stronger together. Yeah. Yeah, true. Another Absolutely. thing, now that you have talked about Google and development partners, you're on the spot now. Mm -hmm. Who are these people we have been collaborating with? Wh which people are we collaborating with, both over uh, overseas and uh, and uh, in 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 land? And in <laughs> 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 yeah, but what people have we been able to collaborate with to make the ICT sector uh, a wow factor? Hmm. Hmm. There are so many. Yeah. Several. I don't want. My apologies in the event that I don't mention you as a collaborator, but I am just going to say off head some of them. Mm. 
we have had in no in no order really because I might start with one and then say oh I've given more support or collaboration but all of you we appreciate the collaboration in whatever form it has come we have had some of the big uh, projects we've had funded yeah, I started with UNCDF they supported us on the inclusive digital economy scorecard on policy related issues kudos thank you very much then we have world bank um, has supported us on expanding dig- you know the infrastructure uh, of this country we have had support from uh, I think we uh, Exim Bank or Huawei Chinese we have worked with them and we continue to work with them on different things, not only infrastructure development. So when you see this backbone, the national backbone infrastructure expanding, we have support from these uh, development partners. When you see Wi-Fi access points in this uh, country, we have had support from World Bank. I know UNDP is also coming on board. We have uh, the Belgians yes, actually running a program with us uh, on uh, called Enable. Yes. Where they are trying to enable human, develop human resource capacity yes. of um, the ICT sector. You know, when we say we are digitizing, we are using um, devices. I have to showcase devices. <laughs> uh, when we are using these things, we we also have to have people who know how to use them. Yes. So, you know, some many of, especially the, the younger generation has no problem, but the older generation has we call it some migration problem, yes. migrating from analog to digital. So they have to be taught to, you know, be up to speed. Give me one and second. Uh, for the first time, mm-hmm. the young people are not a problem. <laughs> like, we have no problem. This is a no, good... No, 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 no. <laughs> young people don't have a problem when it comes to this device, learning to use these, these devices. You find even a four-year-old, a two-year-old can, you know, swipe yeah. Uh, oh, yeah uh, and find scroll YouTube and do uh-huh. it like what is going on yeah they start from six months so the older generation are the ones who need to be aligned but also we need more skills in the sector they are more sophisticated skills and using office or word we have sophisticated applications for analytics for planning you know for artificial intelligence and all that mm. so the belgians have done a good job with us uh the french we are working with them on uh, coming up with some kind of uh, collaboration. Yes. We have the Japanese, JICA. Yeah. We have done some studies with them and also are going to collaborate with them on other aspects. Animation. We have, um, yeah. who else? There are so many. There's so many. We have even, uh, yes, uh, with the Dubai Expo, we have been able to come up with a number of collaborations from uh, United Arab Emirates. So. Yes. That one as well. Uh, we have had a lot of, if I talk about the ministry alone with these development partners, I might limit myself. But if we look at the entire sp- uh, spectrum of the sector, including academia, where I came from, we have had uh, support from the Swedish Oi. through CEDA project. We have had from the Dutch in the Netherlands through NAFIC project. Yes. So there are several, really. There are so many. And... Uh, USID. Yes. Well, I remember we actually even attended an event on Ministry of Health when they were yes. rolling out the 10-year plan. Yeah, the 10-year roadmap yes. for the, the supply chain. Yes, and we are supposed to offer them. Yeah, and we are going to work with them in this. So all of, I just call upon support from everybody. Yeah. Whatever I have mentioned is actually limited or limiting, but we call upon support from everybody for us to make. Because if we improve the, uh, the ICT sector, Work becomes efficient. We operate efficiently. There's transparency in operations. There's accountability for everything we do. And convenience above all, because you don't want to queue up. The times and ages for queuing up should be behind us True. very soon with mm. this digitization agenda. Yeah. So I f- now that we have, I feel like we are about to complete the communication technologies. Mm-hmm. So I want to ask, what are the aspirations of the I in ICT? The I in ICT is uh, information. Yes, right. Correct. correct. Ten what points. are our aspirations in information? <laughs> ten points. Ten point program. Uh, oh. No, I'm getting you ten points for <laughs> I is information. Ah, My abbreviations, which just uh, a long time of ago. course, uh, <laughs> as a Ministry of ICT, we are the spokesperson for government. 
that is why you see the ministry of ICT, our ministers are always online, you know, communication and uh, communicating, informing the people. But we are also the mother ministry for all ICT cadres in government. Before I joined uh, government in the other world, cadre meant maybe some army guy or something like that. Someone on the front line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, ICT cadre, the officers or employees of in line with ICT across government, they belong to the ministry of ICT. The communication officers as well belong to the Ministry of ICT. So in all ministries, departments and agencies, we have communication officers. Mm. And therefore, these people have to speak to the people about the government programs. Mm. So Ministry of ICT, the I in ICT information, is in charge of ensuring that we speak out to the public, inform them about what government is doing currently, People do not know many things government has done or has achieved, but not only achievements, even challenges that we are facing. Mm. We are human beings. We could fall short. Government is a human being. It can make mistakes. It falls short and it also achieves. But it is important for us as government to speak to our people. Yeah, interact. To, yeah, interact engage. with them. Know what are our plans, mm. for example, for next year. What are our plans? What are our priorities? What have we achieved this year? What have we fallen short of? What were the hindrances? For example, now we had COVID. Economy has just been opened up. What challenges did we face? If these, are, if these were the grand plans, we were supposed to move maybe a thousand steps. Because of COVID, we have not done so. Mm. Why? The public has to know. Yes. And that is our role to communicate. So our aspirations are to ensure that we uh, bridge the gap between government and the citizens. Mm -hmm. And the only way we have to do this is to ride or leverage on media houses yes. or different types of platforms. Right now I'm on podcast. You're the Ugandan podcast. And I'm podcast? talking to the people. Yes. Yeah. So we are going to come up with several of these podcasts. We are going to have uh, talk shows. We started, I think, with the permanent secretaries going on TV, different TV houses, I think NTV, NBS, and UBC and others, to talk to the masses yeah. because there are various segments or forums that the media houses reach out to. Mm. The group you find on Twitter is not the same group you find on TikTok. It's not the same group you find on Instagram, Facebook, that is now online, social mm. media. Yeah. Then you will find a different group on television and each, you know, uh, television house has a different audience. Mm. There are those that reach out to women. There are those that reach out to children, those that reach out to adults. All of us are Ugandans and should learn what is happening. What is happening. Yes. Yeah. But so our mandate is to ensure that we package this information to reach out to everybody. I need to find a child of five years knowing what government is doing for them. Better yet even just My judge as man. well. Yeah. 80 years or 90 years should know what is happening. Yeah. And see how they can chip in and how they yeah. can benefit. And because at the end of the day, we're all taxpayers. Yes, yes, yes. That's and by the on that note, my viewers, <laughs> Brandy here is a communication officer of the Ministry of ICT yeah. in charge of communication. So we are really working hard to ensure that we bring the message down to our people. Yes, and also now we and well have... done. Thank you, thank you. So thank far. you very much. Thank you. We shall wait for reviews on this. We're going to go in the comment section yeah. and just and then scrolling. find out how is Brandy doing or yes. how is the ministry doing how through. How is the ministry doing? Uh, yeah. Yes, that's so true. And also now that we even have a task force that will be evaluating how we are doing, uh, that will be giving us like external remarks mm -hmm. on how we are performing. Yeah. It will be what is objective Yes. Mm. Maybe let me explain to the viewers a bit about this task force. Sometimes yes. people think task forces are for war. For war? For yeah, but yes, COVID. communication is a war. <laughs> it's kind of a war affair because if you don't understand me and I might be misquoted, I might be misrepresented. So uh, this task force is uh, was uh, constituted by the minister to... Act as the minister, I will quote the minister, like uh, it is like an external examiner. Yes. You know, when you do your exams, whether PLE or PLE, PLE is primary living exams. You, you <laughs> come through with the abbreviations. Where, whether you're doing uh, all level exit entry, I mean exit exams or um, high school and then university, and you research. always have, yeah, it is not your teacher's 
in your school who mark you. They give somebody else to assess you. Yes. So even us in government, we are taking on to this approach that, you know, we are in here in government operating. Maybe things are not working out right and we think they are or things are going wrong and we don't know what to, you know, how to deal with them or how we are faring. So this task force is here to assess and uh, give positive criticism. We call it positive criticism. Yes. yes. Where you, yeah, you criticize somebody, but in a way to improve them. Yes. Not to put them down no. or pull them down. So, uh, yeah, we're using this approach of, I told you, government is a human being. It makes mistakes. It can improve so that uh, we come up with a better, you know, implementation of our communication process. Mm. We have, I told you, the Ministry of ICT is in charge of policy, but also implementation. Um, we have come up with a policy on communication that we are going to table soon to cabinet. Okay. A policy on national guidance, because I know Brandy will ask me what is national guidance, but we had a minister for national guidance. But yes, a policy on guiding the citizens of this country on how to be Ugandan and feel and be proud of being a Ugandan. Yes. Um, I don't want to use the word ideology, but yes, <laughs> that, that is what it is. Yeah. And then a strategy for implementing these policies. Yeah. You no know, strategies are like, you know, how this is the ecosystem we want you to operate in. Like I told you in the beginning, law and order. Law and order. Police will come up with this, the laws for you to operate. But then to implement the law, they will say, okay, now if you break this law, there is this fine. But if you move on the road like this, you will avoid accidents and all that. So similarly, we have a communication strategy that will guide the implementation of this communication policy and be able for, yeah, we'll get the comments from the viewers yes. in various, various media spheres where we'll appear on how we are faring or not even only how we are faring on whether they have now understood or know what government is doing and appreciate it. Oh, and even give us feedback because we also appreciate the feedback yeah. that we can get to improve our country and enjoy living in our country. Yeah, true. Yeah. And also it will help us with standards. Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah, but mm. it's a good thing. Yeah, standards of if you walk there, you know, Brandy is a Ugandan. Yeah. On Based that, on what she's going to pull out or it will it be uh, the outfit. <laughs> yeah, the clothing. We have Ugandan clo yeah, yeah. Uh, representation in terms of dressing, in terms of food, in terms of uh, walking, tumbler and home guard or whatever. I will, I and will, if, <laughs> when I was say, yeah. will give us that real version yes. of tumbler and home guard mm. that I'd never... Yeah, Actually, so, yeah, so many things like that, that represent us, even just in the way we present our, simply presenting our documents, branding ourselves, mm -hmm. your brandy, but yes, the way we brand ourselves as a country is also important. Yes. So that when you pull out your documents or letterhead or anything, someone knows this is Uganda. Okay, so on that note, P.S., what, what makes you Ugandan? You as you. Uh, mm. You are saying brandy and branding <laughs> and what? What makes me Ugandan? I said there are many things that represent Uganda from dressing to food. What's I it? love matoke and I know I don't know whether matoke exists anywhere else. Uh they they used to tell me in South America they eat matoke, but when I tried their matoke, it didn't taste like it was matoke. A matoke. No, 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 no. It wasn't, it wasn't soft and <laughs> I like that matoke that is soft. Yes. That has been cooked. I don't know whether it's nutritious because it has been cooked for hours. I don't know whether it still has that food value. I think the banana leaves. But maintain. it is nice. Yeah, nice matoke with uh, ground nuts, yeah. ground nut sauce with fish, dry fish in it. That is really actually, delicious. You're actually a nutritious eater. <laughs> now that, now that, that is delicious. And then what else makes me Ugandan? Mm. What else? My name. Your name. Yeah, my names are wedded. Does not mean they are finished. Yeah. yeah you know, <laughs> you see the presence of you is actually amazing. So well, we yeah. Have, we have Zawede, me, yeah, it could be that. Secretary. Yeah, Zawede could be meaning that, yeah, we've saved the best for, for last. last. Yeah. yeah. It <laughs> could be, yeah. Oh, in yes. That. Actually, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, significantly, yeah, that makes me a Ugandan and I'm proud yeah, to actually, be Ugandan. You share a name with Azawi. Did you know? 
Yeah. That's why we, we do great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we have Zawede the artist and <laughs> Zawede the techno <laughs> the ICT guru. Well done. Thank you. Okay, so another question as we almost uh, what three things come to your mind when you think of the parish development model? Oh. The parish development model that is uh, the hottest topic. Mm, PDM. Hot PDM cake. is the hottest topic in government today <laughs> in Uganda today. Uh, it is a program yeah. uh, whose idea was birthed by uh, His Excellency, the President of his country, of Uganda. And we thank him for you know giving birth to this idea. Our role is to implement and ensure that it is a success. Now, the parish development model's main objective is to improve household incomes, the incomes of the person in the parish or in the village. Now, before government programs have been uh, done at, you know, ministry level, district level, but probably not trickling down to the last person. But now we are saying, let's use this bottom-up approach. Mm where we want resources to come to closest to the, uh, to the parish and get to the people at the ground level to help them uh, support their businesses, mainly agricultural businesses or agricultural activities so that they, you know, um, make money out of it or earn a living out of it. And with that, that will improve their income and like uh, welfare or well-being. Mm, that is what we are aiming for. Yes. Everyone should, you know, be well off in our country. So that is the aim and purpose of this program. Mm-hmm. Um, the program has seven pillars. I think one day you should have an interview with the PDM uh, okay. secretariat or coordinators of PDM and prime minister, president himself, to talk about this in detail. It has, uh, it is based on seven pillars that are supporting the growth of this uh, parish development model. But these seven pillars are not, uh, do not hold equal weight. Some are more important than others. Animal farm. <laughs> <laughs> no, not in an animal farm way, but in terms of priority and oh, prioritizing okay. Okay. the importance of these pillars. Yes. So we have first the productivity pillar of agriculture that is the main important because it's the core. Yes. You know, pillar, we have the financial inclusion pillar amongst them where that is supporting the distribution of these funds and monitoring the funds, which is called the financial inclusion pillar. We have the we have the pillar on um uh, governance and administration, we have community mobilization and mindset change, we have social services, infrastructure, then we have this pillar that I have saved best for last, Mm. where the Ministry of ICT is the lead. It is called the Parish Development Model Information System. Yes. Also as called the Community Information System. Now, when we are talking about all these programs, remember I I told you the convenience of using systems. Yes the efficiency that comes with it, accountability that comes with it, and transparency, as well as planning from an informed point of view. Um, We are developing a system. I'm saying we are developing because we are, this system is rather complex because it is supporting all the seven pillars. But we are developing, uh, it has components that support each pillar. Now, we are not developing the system from scratch for some pillars because like agriculture has a number of systems in place. Ministry of Health has a number of systems they are already using to collect some information. So we look at what is this information that we need to help us in planning and monitoring yes. and evaluation, then we'll pick those factors. So we are not going to develop from scratch for those modules. But we have developed um, a module for registration of uh, citizens and uh, it, we are using it, registration and data collection, that is what we call it. And then we have a module on financial inclusion. Then we have a module on monitoring and evaluation and also a module on citizen participation and feedback. I told you we need feedback from citizens. That's actually my favorite module. Yeah. <laughs> and I will give you one minute to talk about it. Okay. When my role is <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Yes, so we have the interesting thing about this system is that we have not only gone to register households, you know, we can now know where Brandy is at what point and where is her home. 
because you're using G, uh, GIS related uh, tagged systems, then um, we are able to know what you're doing, what kind of income you're generating. And uh, it, this will inform us on letting you know what kind of maybe activity can you operate in that area for you to run. We're also doing v profiling of villages. Yes. Now, uh, the village profiles we have created, we have started a pil piloting this system in uh, five districts in North Bukedi, where we're going to have the launch of this parish development model by the president in a week's time, less than a week now. I think it's on, yeah, it's on Saturday, the 26th of February. Yes. Please. Expect the president to launch in Kibuku. So all of you should turn your eyes to Kibuku. We shall, uh, others can watch on the TV. Yeah, they can watch on TV and <laughs> yeah, get us there. We'll be yeah. having live feeds. But yes, uh, back to the point, uh, we have piloted it in five districts. So in Butaleja, Budaka, Butebo, Palisa, and Kibuku, we have collected collected this information about their villages, about the households. What are we collecting about villages? What are the social services in these villages? How many people are there? Social services in terms of hospitals, schools, water points, roads, um, you know, even internet, because we need internet to go down. Right now we, are, we have connectivity up to the district and sub-counties. Yes counties but then now we want to go back down to the parishes yeah. so all if we get this information then we know you know there's one of the villages that we profiled that has 5000 about 5 uh i think about 5000 people yes and in a radius of 5 kilometers plus there's no school there's no hospital so how do they live? So the question now, those are the questions that come to my mind or our minds that, you know, if there is no school, it, do you know what that means? If there are children in that village that go to school, they have to walk over five kilometers Jesus. to go to That's the nearest so school. If someone is sick, a mother is pregnant and, you know, she goes into labor or their labor and she has to move either on a bicycle and you know you have bicycles either be moved on a bicycle or whatever to the nearest hospital that is over five kilometers away so in that way if we have all this information it would help government to plan or in planning and knowing where are we putting the resources because not all these places are a one size fits all some will have resources or might need resources and some might not so with this system Government, by a click of a button, is able to know the status of our country and what we should do to improve our country. Remember, I told you, we need all Ugandans to enjoy this country. And with such a system, we shall go a long way in uh, improving the wealth, the well-being yeah. of our Ugandans. Yeah. I'm so excited that you keep saying, I want Ugandans to enjoy. Everyone keeps saying... We need to make our country better. Okay, but you're like, I need Ugandans <laughs> yeah. to enjoy. Including myself. I need to enjoy this country. Yes. And yeah, whatever it has to, there is a lot this country has to offer. That's from true. tourism to everything and to planning. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. How are we faring? in? No, you're, oh, wait. In my one minute for citizen interact. Oh, I yes. forgot to do Over to you. Thank you Over for to my you. one minute on my podcast. <laughs> Yeah, but the citizen interaction uh, portal will be very good because it will help us interact with the people, mm. find out, help us profile the different parishes. Mm. This parish, parish A is famous for A, B, C. And if you want to do A, B, C, this is the place. And then it will also help us know how are people doing, get feedback, help them with the frequently asked questions mm -hmm. and so much more and so much forth. Mm -hmm. You can find on our website, my one, minute, my one minute is done. Thank you. Next question to me. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. What, how are we faring in the fourth industrial revolution? Ah, uh -huh. the fourth industrial revolution. I'm glad this time you didn't use uh, an acronym. I was going to say 4IR, I was like, don't yeah? embarrass yourself. <laughs> 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 yeah, the fourth industrial revolution. Now, th this is a very important uh, sphere because the fourth industrial revolution is the fourth generation of uh, evolution of, you know, the industry. Yes. We have had the first, the second, the third, and now the fourth. I know people, my viewers can go and Google about the first, second, and third because, yeah, because of a time limitation. But in the fourth industrial revolution, we have various, you know, technologies, given that the world is... Moving rapidly digitally, 
there's so many technologies that have come up. We have uh, artificial intelligence, we have uh, robotics, we have cloud computing, we have um, several internet of things, we have uh, autonomous you know, vehicles and so on and so forth. But the country is not sleeping. Mm. Uh, or sleeping, but it has also realized the importance of this. His Excellency, the President, set up uh, a team, a task force on fourth industrial revolution, and this task force has come up with a 4IR strategy. The strategy will be launched soon. That uh, strategy for 4IR is guiding our operations in the fourth industrial revolution for this country. Now, uh, but even uh, as we wait for the launch of this strategy that is complete and just... Uh, the blueprint is... Uh, yeah, waiting to be given out as handouts and all this. We have already started on implementing yes. or uh, seeing success of what 4IR is capable of doing to address our country challenges. Um, of course, we have to ride on 5G technologies to make it a success over the country. Currently, our connectivity is still 4G in, in, in not so many places, 3G and 2G. Yes. With 2G, you can't do much of 4IR. So as a country, we also have to upgrade to our, connecti our connectivity. Yeah, later on to 5G because okay. for you to operate, to have... Um, to have you do internet of things, I just by a click of a button connect to my home or anywhere in this country and connect all my gadgets and devices. I need to have high internet speeds. Uh, people doing online learning or virtual reality is one of them. You need those high internet speeds and of course a reduction in, the, you know, at uh, an affordable cost. So we already have in our innovation hub Hey, I didn't mention UICT among the agencies. We have a training institution, Uganda Institute of uh, Information, Communications, and Technologies. Yes. In there, we have our innovation hub where we have innovators and come to work on things. We have had uh, collaboration. So hmm? It's very, very busy, my friend. It is. <laughs> you reach there, yeah. it will look like they're actually hmm? changing the world. <laughs> yeah, they are. Oh, yes, yeah. they are. Yeah, they are. Yes. yes. So we have. Um, Worked with, we are working in partnership with uh, innovators to uh, use various technologies to solve our local problems. Like I told you, we are using artificial intelligence. For example, there is a, um, a group of innovators called Sandbird, but I was with them also back in Makere as part of the artificial intelligence lab. Sandbird has come up with a project for detecting noise pollution. Yes. You know, when COVID happened, because there was a lockdown, the whole world was quiet and there was sanity. I think people were sleeping yes. enough. <laughs> they could get enough sleep thanks to the lockdown. But now that it is open, clubs are all over. There is noise from clubs. There is noise from uh, border borders. There is, you know... There, there is noise from these... Uh, the schools singing anthems every morning. Those, those are okay. It but could be okay, noise. but we have this noise of these trucks that move with, uh, yes, you know, oh, <laughs> you know, those things. Eh? <laughs> the audio so this, yes. and, and that affects our health. Sure. You know, it might look like it is a joke or what, but our health is at risk yeah. because of that. So these people have come up with... Uh, solution to detect noise pollution there are levels that are defined on what is acceptable noise what is not so that if it is not acceptable then um the 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 officers or offices in charge of ensuring that they fo uh, they, they follow through have a guide on how to determine that you know because i can't switch you off if i don't have proof that actually my monitor is saying this You're out of, yeah, this is bad. This is dangerous. Mm. So they are helping us do that. There is also, um, I think, uh, an air core project that is part of Makere where they are measuring the quality of air. The other one was noise. Now the this pollution. Is actually yeah? very interesting. <laughs> the quality of the air that we breathe. We have so many cars with, you know, that black smoke coming out Those and cars all need to that be and maybe some road. industries. So there are also acceptable levels of pollution that they measure 
and then they actually inform people on so many things. These solutions can help even decide, can I reside in this place or should I look for another place to reside in? Because you know where you build and construct your house will determine your lifestyle and the fate of life you will have. Maybe that is why we have all these cancers coming up. Mm. You never know. But it is through methods like this or strategies of relying on the strength and potential of artificial intelligence to uh, give us solutions to so many things. So, so we have moved some steps towards 4IR because you asked how far have we moved. Mm, we have a strategy that is going to yeah. drive us. Yes, we have the smart city concept because smart cities, what does it mean? Not how you dress smartly, but how you do business digitally yes. or how you operate digitally in a space. So we already have a potential collaboration with the Entebbe City. Um, we want Entebbe City to become the living example of smart cities that others can learn lessons from. There is also a lot of research that is being done by the Ministry of Lands, um, Labor and Urban Development to, you know, find out how is it that we can improve cities, municipalities, because we have a number of cities coming up, but we want them to be digitally enabled. Yes. And that is why now we call upon all this, you know, support from uh, our sponsors, partners, collaborators, and so on to make our living spaces and life spaces convenient okay. and comfortable That's to so live cool. in. When all these services move from Entebbe and reach like Nigeria, the joy we shall experience <laughs> in this country Nigeria is, is supposed to have smart people. Smart. <laughs> That's how they can make a smart city. Mm. All right, that's okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, do you miss, I know you come from the academia. Do you miss teaching? Even right now I'm teaching. Mm. You're teaching? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Every day I teach. Yeah, and that's uh, so true. Teaching does not necessarily mean sitting in class and facing students to teach them. Mm. Every person you meet and educate them and tell them about the vision you 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 want and where you're heading, you're teaching them. Yeah. Um, yes, I miss my students, but I find them in so many places. You know, when you're a teacher, you know so many people. You run into them even where I am at the ministry. Someone comes, oh, she taught me, she taught me, she taught me. So uh, I can't say I miss teaching because I continue to do so. Every time I sit, even in meetings, I have to explain to people where we want to take the sector. So that is educating them. I am a mentor for children and the youths and especially I don't want to say especially the girl child because I have sons as well. But <laughs> yes, I, I really enjoy seeing the youths grow yeah. and uh, appreciate themselves and discover the potential they have within them. So that is that is me. That is what I live and yeah. promote. Yeah. And therefore, yeah, teaching is my lifestyle. Maybe yeah. one story to tell. <laughs> Teaching was not my passion growing up, yeah. <laughs> but my father, he's a teacher. Yes, retired. Yeah, I think thought you know those people who have who are doctors and want all their children to be doctors. Yes, I am a and doctor. Then, <laughs> all of you, everyone. I am. A, I'm, I'm an I'm engineer. A, all of you. Then uh, yeah, uh, he's a teacher. All of you. No, but we we he wasn't like that until after university. He says yeah. I have done statistics. Yeah, I did statistics and later on computer science. Analytical. So, <laughs> really? <laughs> so he says, oh, why do you wait to get your job? You go and do this nine months course. A, a diploma in education, postgraduate diploma, just for just. Yeah. He said, but I've never wanted to be a teacher. He says, no, you just do it. When you, even if you're halfway and you jump out of it, yeah, it will be the end of it. But as you pass, instead of passing too much time, you go there. But nine months elapsed before the job came and I came out as a teacher. Yeah. So that is how I became a qualified teacher. teacher but yeah. yes, it's a passion to engage and uh, always let people learn something new or aspire them to be somebody. Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting. That's true. They say when you stop learning, you stop growing. Mm -hmm. And just so you feel comfortable, you just because your students are not here, you got new students. You're my student. There is me, there is Paul, there's <laughs> Even Monica, these guys in the camera are my students. <laughs> yes. Even my makeup artists. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone. Yeah, I could go on. The list is long. Yes. But let me not... Uh, 
Flavia, I could go on, but we we so many people the ministry and mm-hmm. enjoy learning from you. Yeah. And being mentored. And I am proud I'm proud of everybody that I have interacted with. Yeah. And I have to take through to discover their potential. Yeah. Yeah. It's only the beninging. That's <laughs> what they say. Is it is that what they say? Mm-hmm. Okay, so as a visionary, you said something about vision and s- taking the sector somewhere. What's your vision for the sector? In just a few words, in three words. Or, a f- or less. Or, le- or in one word. That will be really up to you. <laughs> yeah, my vision is to see a sector that, uh, because we are the lead of the digital transformation program, first of all, the country and government have realized the importance of, you know, transforming this country digitally. Yes. Or digitizing all processes. We want to move away from that, those days where you used to go to hospitals and see stacks of files, or you visit a government office. For me, I used to relate government office with files, files of all uh, colors. Someone swimming in files, pink, yellow, blue, some torn, some new. So we want to move away from that world and find a clean desk. Mm-hmm. A PS seated on a clean desk, seated with her laptop, but all these files are on a system. Mm-hmm. I am checking on the system. We already have an e-records management system where we have files uploaded. It will, we have used it at the ministry and public ministry of public service. It will soon be rolled out to government to the entire government. We are moving procurement online. We have developed an EGP system. So the vision is to see us transform this country digitally, digitize all government processes yes. so that we do everything online. That parish development model system we are developing so that, you know, planning in a office of the prime minister, they just sit here, click on a button and say, oh, this is, these are the priorities for next year because we have moved these steps and improved in this area. We are now going to invest in another area. So if you have, and why is it like that? Because today, uh, everything we do if we are to succeed, depends on data. Data yeah. is like the new gold. You know, when you have gold, you glitter and, you know, everyone admires you. When you use data to, it's um, when you discover the potential of the data that you have, it will inform you in doing so many things, planning for the education sector, for the health sector, for the agriculture sector, for the infrastructure that we have for the well-being, planning for governments and budgets and all the, all this depends on the data and we can only acquire that if we have transformed digitally. So my vision for the sector is having holistic digital hol- transformation. Holistic means even the people yes. have to be transformed. Have, their skill sets have to be transformed to be able to operate in the digital space. True. The people, the processes, and... The output, the outputs, yes. actually output oriented. If you had this now, I was going to be very confused. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I, I also look forward to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do, and uh, one more question. Okay, one last one. One one. You, <laughs> how do you enjoy your free time? Ah, mm-hmm. I like my me time. Okay, meditation and, mm, and watching. I like the trees. I like uh, yeah my me time. I like walks and jogging. Mm. I love laughing mm. in my free time. Yes, I have, uh, love having a good laugh and uh, reading. Yeah, books and novels that will you know improve improve my thinking and also love being with my family. Yeah. I love being with my children, with my husband, with. Everybody and my family, my parents and siblings and friends. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that is how I do it. I also love adventure. Mm. Mm. I, I love rafting. Jumping. Rafting? Yes. I, find, I have so much. I have, I have climbed have cliffs. Of rafting for <laughs> I have climbed cliffs. I have rafted. I am yet to go to the peak of Mount Renzori. I will tell That's Lily, on my bucket I'll list. I'll tell Miss Lily Ajarova to carry uh-huh. you with We should go together. <laughs> yes, step. we should. We actually should go with Lily yeah. to explore Uganda. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Please. Yes. Okay. As we close, mm-hmm. do you have a word of encouragement to the citizens of Uganda, to the staff at the ministry, to the government as a whole, or even to me at mm. the very whatever? Words of encouragement. Words, words of, of hope. Words of <laughs> That's hope. That's what you call them. Yes. And encouragement. <laughs> yeah. I love giving hope. Yes. Uh, yeah. Words of encouragement are that if you've set out to do something, 
there is nothing that can stop you or fail you as long as you're motivated. Mm. Let's have the will and hope and love for a good country that will push us. Whenever I sit back and say, I want to live in a good Uganda, it will push you to you know, do what you can to get the best out of it. Yeah. So that alone, no, failure is not an option. It, that, is, that is my word of encouragement. You should always have it at the back of your mind that failure is not an option unless if you're the cause of that failure. But if mentally you know you can do it, physically you can, then drive yourself and of course god above all yeah. will drive us to deliver yes. whatever we want okay that is so cool i hate to be the bearer of bad news but we have come to the end of this episode of the podcast thank you brandy for hosting me today yeah. and thank you our viewers for having an evening with us yes yeah could even be a morning and <laughs> <laughs> you can do whatever you want but okay. uh, thank you very much for joining us today has really been awesome I have learned so much Dr. Avina Zawede is very cool she's one of the coolest bosses I've had and uh, I can't wait for us to fulfill our vision as a whole for the ICT sector and now we shall have a poem from Howard Chimbugwe and uh, please enjoy follow us on our socials and we're going to share your Twitter handle Yes, 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 yes. Mm. At, it's very easy. Mm, it's, mm. it's down there, don't worry. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please follow us and uh, give us your comments and let us know who you'd want to have. But I'm not telling you who's coming next, but enjoy. Thank you very much. For God and my country. With dreams unrealized, with promises unfulfilled or forgotten with trust broken with all hope lost by most the youth found their way out of the country yesterday some through companies others on their own searching for greener pastures with a euphoria of utopia that wasn't the case during their stay disappointed their dreams have remained unrealized, promises still unfulfilled or forgotten, trust still broken, hope still lost by most. They forgot that pastures are only green where they are watered. Some have faced their demise. Others have found their way back to the country to start from scratch to scratch the education they had attained because it has had them detained from the adjustability necessary for the speedy dynamism the 21st century possesses. It is time they learn that education is not the key to success. Success is not a door, it's a process. It is time they learn they have to think and rethink, to save and invest, to re-strategize and innovate. It is time they learn from their mistakes. It is time they learn that they could offer their expertise or services while still in their countries of residence. It is time they know that they could be the third party taking care of specific work processes of businesses overseas. Services like legal services, digital marketing, accounting and payment processes, research and analysis, human resource and customer services. Better yet, they could still learn at the job if they didn't have the expertise, not to tease, but what you know now, you once knew not. Business process outsourcing is the future. Global presence is the new opportunity. Take it. I know let is better than never, but remember, you never have the second chance to make the first impression. Learn, believe, and embrace the above. For only then will your dreams be realized. Only then will promises be remembered and fulfilled. Only then will trust be regained and only then will your hope be restored. <laughs>